All right, guys, I'm just going to, a quick introduction to our next speaker. It's a real privilege and honor to, to host Josh here at ShakaCon 6. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Josh, he's the director of research, right? Is that right? At Acuvant. Um, and he's also the author of the Android Hacking Handbook, right? And he's, uh, he's been, is that right? No? Close enough. Close enough. And he's, uh, he's donated two to the raffle tomorrow evening. Um, so without any further ado, Joshua Drake. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. So uh, I can skip some slides now since Jason was so good at introducing me. Uh, here's a quick outline of what I'm going to cover today. Uh, let's jump right in. So me, as, as he said, I work at uh, Occupant and uh, lead author of the Android Hackers Handbook. There's actually five other authors uh, with me, so uh, not alone by any means, although it was, uh, you know, difficult for all of us. So also founded the DroidSec Research Group. It's just a, basically a bunch of guys that hang out in IRC. Started with about five guys, and I think right now it's almost 100 people in the channel on Freenode. Uh, some, some of you guys may know me from previous work at Verisign or at Rapid7, uh, where I was their lead exploit developer for about a year, and a half, maybe a year and a half. So uh, my focus for a long time has been uh, exploit development, uh, learning about vulnerabilities, how they work, how they can be leveraged for remote code execution or, or privilege escalation. Uh, mostly memory corruption focused, although I've done a lot of other things as well. Uh, so the, the motivation of this talk is to, to help people overcome what I see as the biggest problem in doing research on Android security, uh, and that is fragmentation. So what do I mean about that? Uh, what causes that? So uh, how many people in here have an Android phone? That's pretty good. Is it only only device or also iPhone? <laughs> Some people have them all, right? So, uh, uh, so with Android, what you'll, you'll see is if everyone brought their devices together in this room and put them all next to each other, you'd see they're all wildly different looking. You know, you start playing with each one, you go to the home screen or go to the menu or drop down the status bar, they're all different. So there's just tons of differences between all these devices. Uh, some devices, you know, they have uh, hardware changes completely. So um, a good example is the Samsung Galaxy S3 or S4 or S5. Uh, in the U.S., they have several different versions, or worldwide, they have several different versions. And usually, like, a good example is that the S3 for Sprint is a totally different model number and even uses a totally different processor than the global international S3. So uh, even within a single thing that's marketed with one name, you may have completely different things on the inside. Uh, other things we mentioned, the, the look and feel, uh, the code changes that are underneath there uh, or to support features that are custom to a certain OEM, those things all change things as well. And, and they could uh, affect the attack surface or you know, just they could even add a back door, which has been seen in some cases. Uh, the development is scattered too, so that adds to it. Uh, we're talking about OEMs making changes, so Google kind of makes Android itself and they keep it all closed behind closed doors and they release, and I guess today is the start of Google I.O., so I'm assuming soon, maybe today, tomorrow, there'll be a new version of Android being released. It's kind of like once a year they do this big unveiling of all the work they've done um, development-wise that's not, you know, that doesn't need to be pushed out in a patch. Uh, and so after they do their thing, then they kind of like give it to the OEMs, and the OEMs make all their changes then. So it's kind of like a, a tree of life, if you will, for Android development, and through all these processes people can inter introduce new security vulnerabilities and so on. Uh, so another thing, here's an effect of the fragmentation. This is uh, one of the guys who works on the Qualcomm product security team. Those guys are amazing. They're probably the best in the, in the, in the field as far as uh, security goes, and, and uh, you know, both proactive and reactive. They're the only ones that I've seen publishing advisories. They're the only ones allocating CVEs. They're the only ones giving credit to researchers. Uh, to the point where they've even given credit to researchers who like basically just wrote an exploit and released it into the wild, which is pretty nice. Uh, so here is this one guy, he's saying, you know, we fixed a bug, here's the advisory. And then this uh, one of the DroidSec members, Cedric, he says, you know, do you know what's vulnerable to this? And he basically says, well, we only know kind of what trees of our code bases are vulnerable. We have no idea who's used those or what devices those might be on. So. 
Uh, this is an example of, of how fragmentation can, can mess security up. Uh, so the other effects are, you know, research time is multiplied. So if you're doing an audit on a particular device, you, you may spend several weeks doing that. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is you have to focus on one device because if you try to focus on all of them, then, you know, so, uh, so if you try to focus on more than one, then you're just going to have to keep retesting a lot of things, right? So, so if you, you test like a certain intent does a certain thing on one phone, it may not do it on another phone. So you have to kind of do that, and it, and it, and it makes it really time consuming. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the attack surface changes. So physical devices really sort of become a requirement. Uh, and in the Android Hacker's Handbook, I also wrote that, you know, um, I, I recommend physical devices for security research anyway because the emulators are typically very slow to use. Um, there's an x86 emulator, which is actually pretty fast. But if you're sticking to ARM and you want to do things with ARM, then it's very slow. Uh, but also for the hardware reason. So, so what I came up with while I was writing the book is kind of like a distraction so that I could keep my motivation and keep myself not necessarily focused, but at least uh, my morale up, was to work on this side project of collecting Android devices and putting them together. So uh, this talk is mainly about that, that uh, contraption that I've created. And it's both, it's both a hardware and a, a software project, so it's not just uh, something you can download. It's, and uh, we can do a quick demo real quick. Let's we'll see if I can do it from this little keyboard. Oh, look at that. So uh, this, this little script is part of the stuff I released, and it basically takes a, a, a little database in a Ruby hash format and, and goes through and runs ADB devices, checks for all of the serial numbers that are there, um, for devices that are present. And then it creates a little database which is used by these other scripts which, so that it'll only query the devices which are actually there. It won't query you know, every device that I've ever seen or I've ever had at my house. Um, and so here I, I can run one command real quick and get a list of all the kernel versions for all the devices that are currently plugged in. So th this is kind of like a quick demo of, of what it's capable of to use this tool and I'll go into more details about what else is possible. Here, this will give you the, all the Android versions for all the devices that are plugged in as well with their model names and uh, what keys they were built with and all that stuff. So uh, that's a quick demo of what the tools can do. So uh, existing solutions. Uh, I started this being inspired by AppKudo. I hope I said their name wrong or, or, or right, I guess. <laughs> So they inspired me. This picture is of their setup. Uh, I was like, wow, that looks really cool. I'd really like to have one of those. And, and they, uh, they started their business basically because they wanted to help OEMs and app developers test their applications across all these devices. Um, not necessarily from a security point of view, but m more on the app level and more you know, because different devices do have different hardware. Different devices have slight hardware or software modifications. They have different screen sizes. You know, you can imagine if you're trying to make an app that has some buttons and you've got some auto layout that you may want to see it on a whole wide range of devices so that you know if your buttons are in the wrong place or getting wrapped funny or something like that. Uh, and since then, I've also found the uh, Testroid, AppThwack, and uh, the Xamarin Test Cloud. Although the Xamarin Test Cloud uh, got acquired by someone, and I, th I think their focus isn't exactly Android. It's uh, a little bit different, so their Android capabilities are uh, getting less attention. These numbers in parentheses are, are roughly the number of devices that they have uh, available if you want to use their stuff. But the, the problem I have with their stuff is it is really app focused. And um, it, it, they don't, they're not going to help you do security stuff, I don't think. Maybe they would be open to it. But you know, there's legality concerns like those are their devices. Is it OK for you to go root them all? Um, you know, rooting is, uh, it's really an important first step if you're going to do security research on Android. Like, if you ADB shell into a, a stock Android device and you try to list, like, the data directory or something to see if there's any directories underneath it that have bad permissions or something like that, you can't even do that unless you root the device. So, so you need root to do research, and, and that makes it difficult to use these, these guys' as clouds for it or these guys, Android Clouds, or however, you want, however they want to market it. Uh, you know, the other thing is, is it OK for you to go and pull information like I just pulled from my device cluster? You know, is it OK to run 
commands to pull all the information from the devices, or is it okay, for example, to list what's in the SD card directory? Like, are they gonna be mad about that? Um, physical, physical proximity requirements are another thing. Basically, like, uh, some things that you have to do, you have to touch the device. You know, you have to, like, especially with security, there have been vulnerabilities where in order to exploit them, you have to do something, run an app or run a script, and then, you know, uh, drag down the menu and then turn Wi-Fi on and turn it back off. It's, it's something that's a little bit more difficult to do when you're nowhere near the device, although some things can be automated. And, and finally, like OPSEC fail, right? If you're, if you're looking for zero-day vulnerabilities or you're looking for unknown attacks that are against Android devices, you really don't want to just kind of be running those on somebody else's uh, systems. You, know, you don't want to leave your, your exploits laying littered across all these different devices. And so the answer I came up with to do this was just to build my own. So the next section here is about building it. Does anybody have any questions at this point? All right, cool. You feel free to raise your hand and stop me anywhere, anywhere along the way, it's fine. Uh, we'll do a longer Q&A at the end with the, the, the period we have. So the original design was pretty simple and crude. I just wanted to get me a big ass hub and plug lots of devices into it, as many as I could. Uh, so I, I, I made my initial purchase. It was a $75 hub called the Mondo Hub. I was like, yes, this is gonna be awesome. So I had some old devices, ones that I used to use and I don't use them anymore. They're all kind of in boxes. I'm like, let's get those out. So I get them all out. Uh, this is a quick side note, this slide. Uh, the things in green are things I recommend and the slides will be released later. Like these are the ways of getting devices I recommend. Uh, the stuff in red, not so, not so hot in my opinion. And the yellow is kind of like, well, you know, it's more money, but sometimes you have to. Like, if you want to do research on a Galaxy S5, you either got to find somebody that bought one and doesn't want it anymore, like right away, or you have to pay full price for it. So sometimes it happens. Uh, but by and large, most of the devices I got, I got through eBay or Facebook garage sales or asking friends, uh, or even, you know, the, the, and this is out of date actually, the Verizon Moto G at Best Buy is actually $50 right now, I think. So. Um, so these people all help me by giving me devices and uh, give me advice and stuff. So let's give these guys a round of applause. Thank you. All wonderful people that were very helpful and generous. You'll see Google was in there. Thank you, Google. Uh, so there's the Mondo Hub. If you guys have never seen the Mondo Hub, it's, it's pretty intense. It's got USB ports all along the side and then some on the top and then uh, there's two rows of buttons, which are actually hardware switches for each port. Uh, the downside is it, internally this hub is, is uh, it's actually like five hubs daisy chained together. So when you plug it in, you see this like hierarchy of this crazy thing and you're like, oh, that's weird. Uh, I thought I was getting a 28 port hub. Like, you know, you thought you'd get kind of 28 ports, but that doesn't work that way. And we'll get into that more. Uh, so these are the devices that I had hooked up. You can see at the top there's a Droid Eris and then there's a couple of uh, Android TV sticks, a couple of old uh, Droid Ones, the OG Droid, and then uh, a couple of other devices. I think they're Droid Incredibles. So uh, as time went on, you know, this is 0 0.7, 0 0.8, I got some dev boards. Uh, the top right you can see the Panda board and then the top left you can see an origin board. Uh, all, the, all along the way getting more USB cables and down in the right corner, I think that's a Galaxy Nexus, and then the Nexus 7 2012 there in the gray in the case. So I keep going, uh, I keep building more, you know, write some more book, order some more devices, write some more book, order some more devices. And so this is kind of like, uh, you know, only th three months in, and I've got a bunch more devices from eBay. And then at this point, I really start to realize the benefits of doing this project. Because at this point, I can start running commands across these devices from a wide variety of OEMs, seeing what's similar, what's different, seeing you know what's similar between devices that have the same system on chip, but maybe from different OEMs. So I start to really see a lot of the different groupings of, of uh, code bases behind different hardware. So this is a, a kind of a big jump. Uh, there's a lot of writing going on in this place and a lot of ordering devices. <laughs> so. Uh, here in July 2013, I took this picture just before I did a presentation at Recon, which is this weekend, uh, this year. And so this shows just, I got a lot more devices basically. It's, it's you know, the pot's getting bigger there. 
Uh, yeah, the CRT monitor, I got rid of that real recently. Sorry, guys. <laughs> So disaster strikes at this point. Uh, you can see this is still the Mondo Hub. So disaster strikes, the Mondo Hub is dead. What happened was uh, the Mondo Hub, it comes with a four amp power supply. And if you do the math, typical Android device or USB device takes about half an amp. And at 28 ports, that's you know 14 amps. And so four amps, 14 amps, it's become a bit of a power distribution problem here. And uh, eventually, the, the mono ports started losing, uh, losing ports. They just disappeared, like got fried. I actually had it, uh, I'm not gonna blame the Mondo Hub necessarily, but one of those Android USB sticks just died. Uh, and you know things were just dying. And at this point, uh, I got out a few hubs after asking around. And you can see in the bottom right corner, there's these, these three black hubs. Uh, and at this point, all, all I had was plugged in was you know, gingerbread and ice cream sandwich devices, or sorry, uh, ice cream sandwich and jelly bean. Like the, the phones on the left side are all like gingerbread and below and they're kind of stacked up neatly out of the way. Uh, so at this point, you know, I'm scrambling to get what I have together and I only have these three hubs. So that's why I don't have them all plugged in at this point. Uh, so then I was like, well, you know, if I'm gonna rebuild this, I don't wanna have the same problems I had when I bought the Mondo Hub, like being disappointed by the hardware. And so I started doing research to figure out wh what are the limitations of USB? Uh, you know, what is really gonna make this kind of future-proof forever, right? Like how can I solve this forever instead of just solving it to get by it uh, because it died? And so I asked around on Twitter and I was like, you know, how many, uh, how can I hit the 127 port thing after reading that there is a 127 port maximum? And I get some responses like, uh, why would you want to do that? Or uh, do you need to be able to still talk to them? Like, or do you just want to pretend like you have 127 devices? I'm like, no, I really need 127 devices. Uh, so Osman tells me, you know, he's, he also has done a bunch of research with USB and a little bit on Android with USB. He tells me the most I've seen on an IC is seven, which makes perfect sense, right? You've got this Mondo Hub, it's a chain of hubs, and it, it makes sense because it's a multiple of seven as well. So you're like, oh, I see, you know, it's got basically some seven port hub ICs in there with some wiring. I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense. And he says you need at least 21 hub ICs. I haven't, I haven't gotten... Uh, aggressive enough to like try to build my own version of the Mondo Hub, although I've seen some similar projects out of the Bitcoin space. So I did some math. Uh, I started drawing some diagrams to come come up with the maximum that I could have, um, given these two limitations of, of of seven only depth from the root hub, including the root hub, and also a maximum of 127. Right? I want to have the least amount of hubs with the most amount of devices. Uh, and so I came up with this design, and this is this is a realistic maximum Android cluster uh, of 108 devices, and it, you hit 127 pretty quickly with only 19 hubs in this case. Although there are several unusable ports, theoretically, God knows what happens when you plug something into one of those ports because it will be under over the 127. That could crash your kernel. Who knows? I haven't tried it. Uh, I don't have 108 devices at this point, so we'll get into what actually looks like right now. So. Built off, I built it off recommendations from Charlie and Sergey and Osman and a lot of people, a lot of chats here and there, and like publicly and then also privately. And basically what I came up with was the best candidate was these D-Link seven port hubs, which, you know, as you saw before, seven ports is the max IC anyway. So this kind of makes sense. And then they also give you a two amp power supply, which is enough to supply power for all seven ports, or at least pretty, a lot closer than 14, you know, versus four. Uh, the other thing that Charlie told me, he used this for his NFC fuzzing. He said that um, the so these actually have software power control, so you can run a program and tell it to turn off a port, and it'll turn that port off until you run a, uh, the same program and say to turn that port back on. So that's a, a really nice thing to have, especially if things get wonky, devices fall off the, the cluster or whatever, you can just automatically kind of cycle the port and have them come back. Uh, also, bought tons of micro USB cables, some long, some short. I recommend that if you're going to get, uh, if you're going to build something like this, I recommend you at least get one six-foot cable. The extension cords, they work okay, but they're not great. Uh, an actual six-foot cord seems to work a lot better. Uh, and this is important because if you want to, you know, do something where you're going to have to interact directly with a device, then you're going to want to have uh, the cable coming to your desk. And in, in my case, like I have this table behind me on my desk and my desk is here. So I don't want to keep getting up out of my chair and going to touch things and then going back to type things and then going back to touch things. So the, the six foot cord comes in really handy for that. 
So the current topology is this. Uh, I've only got seven hubs plugged into one hub. So the root hub is there, and you know you only get so many ports with your root hub typically on a PC. So I've got one that just one hub plugged into there, which is actually really convenient too, because if I don't want the cluster there, I just kind of yank the one cord, and all the, all the, everything is self-sufficient, you know, and keeps running. But I just can't talk to it, so I can just yank that one cord. Uh, right now, it supports about 49 USD, USB devices, and you could see when I ran the, the, the reconfig script that there's only 45 plugged in at this point. Uh, and that's because some were like spread around in different places in my house, like so I could wake up and be like, oh, was, uh, or whatever. Uh, so another issue becomes apparent after I start hooking this up, right? So if you remember, like everything was in disarray, I'm like, okay, well, I've got to like, now I've got a solution for USB, so let's, let's build this thing back to what it was, get everything plugged in again. And then I run into this problem. So these are the wall warts that come with these USB hubs. And uh, uh, you know, like I said, they're two amps, so the power distribution isn't a problem, but the size of them is totally a problem. Uh, and maybe I could find a different, different uh, power strip that has more space, but I didn't think that was a great idea either. So I, I went and actually did another project where I found some, something on a Bitcoin miner forum where this guy, and I, I can't visit the link at this point, but. Uh, he was building something that would, a cabling system that would plug into a, uh, an ATX power supply. And the idea was to use that to run like ASIC miners, which are like, they look like iPods, but all they do is crack out, you know, crank out hashes. Um, so he made this, and I was like, well, that's great. I would love to do that. You know, I was thinking about trying to get him to do it for me, but then I was like, uh, I don't know who this guy is. And, I don't know what he's going to want, and it'll be more fun to do it myself anyway. I, uh, in a former job before I got into security, I actually was doing uh, robotics engineering and, and programming, so so I did a lot of cabling work there, and so I, it was like kind of a blast from the past. And also, like when you're writing a book, it really helps to have something to do with your hands. You know, it's like a nice distraction. So uh, I already had an ATX power supply hanging around. I bought the Molex connectors, the pins, uh, the barrel cords from DigiKey, all the information that you need to find that stuff is right here. Uh, so I ordered and assembled my own. So here's the cable. These, it took me about two hours to put together all the cables I needed for this. I'm sure you could make a better cable. Uh, I made a whole bunch, like probably 10 of these. I think that's, yeah. So I made 10 of these. And I still have a couple sitting around. But uh, the whole point of this was to connect to the power supply and then to the hubs. So I power all the hubs with these. And that means I only need one outlet in the wall for, uh, for all the hubs. So here's what it looks like all plugged together. I'm sure there's a more efficient way to do this, like I said, because uh, power distribution, I don't think it's necessary to have all those Molex connectors. Rather, it could just be one Molex connector with a bunch of splicing off of that. The important thing to keep in mind here is that the power supply needs to have a good level of amperage that it'll support on the 5 volt rail which is what is used for USB hubs. Uh, in this particular power supply, it's only a 350 watt power supply. I think it does uh, either 25 or 35 amps on the five volt rail, so it's, it's more than enough. So uh, at this point, I'm thinking more to the future. You know, I don't have 108 devices, but what happens if I do have 108 devices? What happens if I wanna go and hit 127? Or what happens if I wanna go uh, and have like you know, 300 like these other guys like Apkudo have? And so some of the ideas I came up with was, was um, the 127 limit and the, the seven distance from the root hub, I think it applies only to the, to the USB host adapter. So you could add more USB host adapters, but at some point in your machine, you're gonna run out of PCI slots. So the other idea I came up with uh, with a friend, and I, I think this is actually really ideal, is to use some small machine like a, a Raspberry Pi or um, I don't really advocate the Raspberry Pi, but something a little more powerful like an Odroid or something. You just plug all the USB into that and then implement a protocol over that over TCP IP, which should allow you to do you know, unlimited scale. Uh, I haven't implemented this yet, but it's on the agenda at some point. Hopefully, if I get some more devices, it'll motivate me to do that. So uh, the other thing is running out of physical space. As you can see, well, as you can see here, the table is getting quite full, and this is this is you know, uh, a three foot by six foot table or something like that in a, in a 14 by 10 foot room. So it starts to get pretty ridiculous pretty quickly. 
Uh, another idea I had was maybe to power, power the f phones without batteries because the batteries can be sort of a liability. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have seen a lithium ion battery that's not very happy, but they typically spew gas and start on fire. So uh, I don't want to have too many of those in my office, uh, especially when I'm not there. So this is the result after I did the redesign, after I did the cabling and put everything together. And then only, uh, a, I think this is maybe about six months later, I got some more devices, and this is what it looks like roughly right now. Although I just sold my house, so I had to tear it all down, and that really sucked. And then I had to put it all back together, which sucked even more. Uh, so now it's not quite like this, but it's the same, roughly the same number of devices. So now about the tools. Uh, so when I started this, uh, AppKudo obviously had some tools, and uh, the other guys that do this stuff must have some tools as well, but as far as I could tell, nobody was giving any of those tools out. So I decided to go ahead and just write something real quick. Um, most of the time when I was doing direct research on an Android device, just a single device, the only command I would really run mostly was ADB. Uh, and also, you know, I would have B BusyBox on the device to, to bridge the gap between kind of the vanilla Android experience uh, from a shell and the more traditional Unix experience that you get on a Linux machine. So no tools existed, and what I did was I put together these scripts, and they're just Ruby scripts, they're nothing amazing, but, but they do help a ton. And they help me provision devices quickly, so if I get a new device, I plug it in, run a couple of commands, and then it's there. And most importantly, I think, is it lets you manage devices by human-friendly names. So if we go over here to this window again, and we do ADB devices. Ooh, I can't type. All right, are we frozen now? That sucks. Let's see if it's this or the other thing. Oh, it's, the, it's this thing, okay. All right, so if we do ADB devices, then you'll see this is what it looks like typically when you're doing that. And that's not very human friendly at all, right? Like, you don't want to go, eh, uh, I want to talk to device 35413247B, you know, like that's not going to work. Um, that's a lot of frustration. So I think most importantly, what that does is it, it lets you give human friendly names to it. So you can say that that crazy serial number is actually like the SGS3 or something. And then you just type SGS3 if you want to know if the SGS3 is vulnerable to something or so on. Uh, also handles transient devices, like I mentioned before, with the, the separate databases, one that is created from what is actually there to, to talk to. Um, you know, I like to play with my wife's phone occasionally, but she definitely wants to have it with her, so sometimes I say, honey, can you bring your phone down? I need to test something, and then she'll bring it down, and, and I can quickly um, make that part of the cluster. Uh, so, and, and the other big, big thing is that it lets you do any tasks that you can think of automating against more than one device. Uh, so the only requirements are the ADB binary and Ruby. I've only tested it on Unix, although uh, theoretically it may work on other things. Uh, so I've only tested it on Linux. Uh, like I said, the script really just wraps ADB. So the usage is very much like ADB. In fact, there's a, an mdo script that's basically just it's basically just ADB, but for each device. Uh, it, it's simple, and then also I recommend this patch that I made to ADB. Uh, by default on an Android device, if you ADB shell in, it'll put you in the root directory, uh, and also there's one other annoying thing where um, those of you familiar with a Unix terminal that you get when you log into a Unix machine, it has a rows and columns attribute to it, and the Android, uh, ADB tool, it doesn't pass that information to the device. So if you have like a big terminal and you ADB into a, a device and run like VI, it's only going to use like this tiny little space in the window. And then also when you type long commands, it wraps all funny. So this patch that I, I link here actually does pass the, 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 the rows and columns into the ADB session, which is much more much nicer, and it also uh, will put you into data local temp, which is a directory everyone, uh, well, the shell user can write to on Android devices, uh, on all Android devices. So it does those two things, and it's really helpful. It depends on BusyBox. Um, BusyBox, like I mentioned, it really helps solve the, uh, the gap issue between the two types of stuff. 
the, the, the tools on Android are often limited. Many devices don't even have the grep command, which is uh, you know, one of those go-to commands for somebody doing security research, especially on the shell. Um, so the best BusyBox binder I found out there, uh, this actually came up when I was writing the book. I was like, man, somebody needs to make a great BusyBox binary one that doesn't have all this crap problems, because uh, there was one that was out there, and it was pretty good, but it was linked against glibc instead of, uh, instead of the Android libc. And so you'd, you'd do ls-l or something to see the users and groups, and they would just come up as numbers. They wouldn't come up with the nice names that were given to them. Uh, and there were a bunch of other silly issues with it as well. And so I put it on my list, like, I'm going to do this. And then shortly before I started doing this talk or put this talk together, uh, Sorek was like, hey, uh, will you test this BusyBox binary for me? Because that's one of the things that I like to do having the Android cluster. I'm like, yeah, just send me whatever. As long as I trust you or as long as I looked at it and it looks good, I'll just go ahead and run it for you and tell you what happens. And so he's like, test it and tell me what happens. And I'm like, oh, well, it doesn't work on you know 2.1 devices and older or something. But, but it, when he was talking to me about what his goal was in making this binary, I was like, oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what I wanted to do. You know, thank you. And I was like, will you put this up somewhere so that I can link people to it and they can use it? And he said, definitely. So that link will take you to that. Uh, supporting data, this is sort of a little bit of a side note, but it's also really important. Um, along with the, the 45 devices and having them live and accessible at all times, I've also got like, I think, 121 gigabytes of stock ROMs for all these devices. Um, this allows you to like do a complete factory restore if you screw everything up, or uh, it allows you to do offline analysis as well, so you can kind of explode the firmware image and then pull a certain binary out if you need that to extract offset, or even pull the kernel out. Um, and this stuff you can do without the, the Android cluster itself. So this is kind of like a, not only a tangential thing that you can use for research, but it's also you know, something that's very complementary to having an Android or Droid Army. Um, you know, just in case, uh, like, he, he swears by having the stock firmware. You know, the first, as soon as the device comes out, he's like, who's got a stock ROM that I can start banging on? And he'll do a lot of you know, sort of offline analysis. It's great. I've done a lot of it, too. So source code, uh, ASP, the AOSP checkout is kind of like one of those things that if you're setting up to do Android research, I recommend you get that like right away, or at least start it right away, because it can take quite a while to, to pull it down. It's about, um, it's about 20, 25 gigabytes or something like that of source code. Uh, and it, it includes a whole binary tool chain, which is the one that, they, that most everyone uses to build their Android systems. Uh, it includes the base source for all Android devices. It includes exact code for the Nexus devices. So if you have a Nexus device and you, and you know they fully support you doing this, so you just pull the thing, you run sort of like a few commands that tell it which device you're dealing with, and then you can build one, and it's pretty much binary compatible with what you already have out of the out of the uh, from the factory images on the the Google on Google site. Um, so that's really nice, especially if you just want symbols for a particular thing. You can just build it, and then you have the symbols that actually match it. Uh, but I would recommend that you don't try to put binaries with symbols onto the device because they don't really fit very well. Uh, the, uh, the WebKit library alone that was something like 750 megabytes if you build it with symbols is like 12 if you build it without. So uh, use the symbols on your host machine for debugging, but don't put them onto the device. Uh, GPL releases, too, is, are great for source code. The Linux kernel is GPL, so everyone who creates an Android device based on Linux kernel has to release their kernel source code. If they don't, you know, you can make a big stink about it and get lawyers on them and stuff, and they, they will eventually, hopefully, do it. Um, there's a bunch more information on supporting data in previous presentations I've done, but also in the book. So let's look at some other stuff that you can do, and I'll try to use the keyboard this time instead of uh, this little guy. So I mentioned system on chip being important. Uh, so M command will just run a, a shell command on every device. And it, the one means to do one line, right? So, so for example, if you want the permissions, the dot means all devices. So dash D dot is all devices. The one means to do it like this, where it puts, prefixes the line with the name of the device and then shows you the information. Uh, if you don't do the one, then you, then you get something more like uh, this thing right here, right? Where it, it prints the device and then a blank line and then the stuff. Uh, so I'm almost always using 1D. Maybe I should make that the default. 
So uh, let's see here. So we can see which devices are rooted here. Uh, looks like there are some that I haven't rooted because I had to tear it all down and put it back together again. Looks like the, the, the Nakasi one, it looks like that one lost root when I upgraded it to the latest version of Android. <laughs> Boo. So this can take a little while. Uh, some, another thing I've identified that I want to try to do is, is kind of thread this out and, and instead of doing it serial because you know some of the older devices that are slower, it would be nice to issue the command and then you know not have to sit there and wait for it to respond while I can go on to other devices and then have the result come back whenever it's ready. Is that my mouse cursor moving all over the place? <laughs> I don't think so. So uh, what else? So system on chip uh, is another good one. We can, we can like run, so there's also this one MBB, this one runs BusyBox as a shell command. So these are all just optimized for less typing to get more out of you know, the command. Uh, so the busy box, we can look at dev platform. I think it's dev block platform. And this one we'll want to do without the, uh, the one. Oh, and we'll want to go ahead and go into there. So this one, if, if you look at it, and I think we could do the one actually. Let's do the one. It's a little more compressed. So just by looking in this directory, you can see the different devices and what chipset they're based on. You can see the ones with MSM, those are Qualcomm devices. You can see ones with S3C, that's uh, Samsung Exynos. You can see OMAP. Uh, and, and these are, this is a really nice sort of grouping to look at because the kernels are split based on the system on chip. So if you have a Qualcomm device, then you have a Qualcomm kernel. If you have an OMAP device, you have an OMAP kernel. And th these are actually completely separated even in Google's uh, source code repositories. So, um, and more, right? Like, because the Qualcomm kernel comes from Qualcomm directly and then goes to Google and then Google releases it. So um, that's the one sort of anomaly to the, to the system uh, of how, where the source code goes or where the development happens. So we did ADB user privileges and we did, uh, we did system on chip and we did uh, root status. So another thing we can do is we can check for vulnerable block devices or vulnerable uh, devices based on exposed driver endpoints. So Exynos MEM is one of those driver endpoints. You can see that, that the i9300 has this endpoint and also the SPHD710, which is the SGS2 on Sprint. And so only these two devices have it, all these other devices don't have it. It's really awesome to be able to be auditing code and say, well, there's this driver. I wonder if any of these Android devices use it. And then you can get the results basically this quickly. Uh, so other things you can do, which are a little bit harder to demo live, uh, and I probably won't do that, is, is sort of compare devices, their processes that are running, their file systems. Uh, you know, you might find that one device has a set UID binary, the other doesn't, or it might have a, a directory in, as a subdirectory of slash data that has insecure permissions, whereas another one doesn't. Or even it will really point out like system applications that are pre-installed, they may have special privileges. And so those, those things stand out really, really a lot when you start diffing things, especially with pro, uh, processes too, like any services that OEMs add on top of the vanilla Android, those will pop out really quickly when you start looking at that. Same with init scripts. So init scripts will also show you those services because they, they, they obviously have to be started at some point and boot up time is a good time to do that. Um, you, can, you can diff key files. Uh, so different applications manifests, you could pull information out of there to see what keys they're signed with or uh, the platform.xml will also sh show you some of that information. There's plenty more things. I mean, any, anything you can think of that is on all the devices but might be different is great to, to sort of look at uh, to see what is different. Th that platform.xml file is actually like the permissions that are defined by the build, uh, that, that device's Android build. So if, if somebody, for example, has a, a extra permission for a camera or something like that and another one doesn't, then you'll be able to, to see that pretty quickly. Uh, one final note on comparing devices, uh, comparing like OEM devices to a Nexus device of a similar sort of generation is, is a really nice thing to do because it, it points out sort of all the modifications that might have been made along the way. 
Uh, so other tasks, I mean, we can definitely like install an app real easily. Uh, that's like super easy. If I have an app, let's see if I have an app. Let's see if we have APKs, no. Let's see if we have some in, in the subdirectories. Oh, I don't know if I want to install those bubble guppies. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we can do it quickly though, right? So the command would just be like one do, one deed like this and then uh, install whatever APK. I guess we can install bubble guppies. Is that the smallest one? <laughs> It'll be fastest. So we can go ahead and do that. It'll go ahead and install this awesome bubble guppies app on everything. It takes a while though, because this one has to actually push, the, push it all the way up and then do the install. So this will take a little bit longer than uh, a lot of other sort of tasks you can do. So in the process of doing it, this, this automates pushing and, uh, and installing. It's part of the ADB command, but we can also like, for example, push, uh, let's see, we do have some exploits here or something? Is it working exploits? Come on, arrow key, you can do it. So I could run one of these old exploits. I think, so I should have had an exploit sitting here somewhere. Let's see, maybe it's in the other directory. Let's go to the other directory. Uh, I try to remember where I put the other directory. Maybe it's in here. Yeah, that is close, but not quite. Let's do this. And I spelled it wrong, all the spelling of the wrong. Oh. Okay, sorry guys. All right, where is it? Oh, yes, that makes perfect sense. Here we go, maybe it's in here. Oh yeah, here we go. Here we go, this should work. So we do a reconfig in this one. This has got a separate, uh, separate setup here. You can see the bionics missing. That one's battery is really bloated and scary, so I took it out, set it aside for a while. So we can do an md1d dot uh, push, and we can put this file in data local temp on all the devices. That's pretty nice. So it doesn't take that long. It should be done any second. And then as we see here, we can also test exploits. Um, one note on the pulling files, this one requires a little bit of special handling in that you have to have device specific directories to pull into. And those just kind of represent the root directory of each device. And you can see here, I have two devices which are similar devices and I've just pulled like some binary off of there or something, not sure which one. So if we do the m command uh, dash 1d dot and then run data local temp, oh, go back, temp cve 2013 6282. I hope this is a good, good one. Let's see what happens when I run it. Yeah, so this one is going to try to root each one and if it roots it, then it will just print uid equals zero and gid equals zero. So this is a, a nice way to, to just test exploits pretty quickly. This exploit can take a little while because um, if, if the device is Jelly Bean, Jelly Bean or newer, it'll have this mitigation called D-message restrict. And uh, that means that it can't actually read the kernel symbols or any of that sort of information real quickly. So this one actually will have to leak the whole kernel until it found that information in memory. So it can take a little while to run on the newer devices. But we'll, we'll uh, let's let it run and we'll go to back to the other window. So another thing that's really nice about these tools is you can run with a subset of things. So you can say like MBB 1D and then you can put like Mako and Hammerhead or something like that. And you can just see, you know, what are, the, what, run commands on only a subset. Uh, and something I wanna do soon is kind of like create artificial groupings. So you can say like run a command on all Qualcomm devices or run a command on all devices to have a 3-4 kernel or something like that. Uh, so there's, you can also run scripts on, on, on these things. So this one finished, oh no, the G1 crashed for some reason. 
But uh, uh, so this this vulnerability only affects 4.0 and later devices anyway. So it, it, it's not really make much sense to run it on the G1. You can run scripts as well, um, and I'm not sure if I have this set up right now because I did have to take it down and put it back together and stuff. Let's see if I have any scripts on there. Come on. Only got a minute left. You know what? Let's just uh, let's just keep going. So, so other other tasks that I've done with this thing is um, I've helped Colin Mulner do some testing on his uh, patch droid tool. Uh, I did a, a a nice little thing where I automated the the testing add JavaScript interface. This vulnerability is really interesting in that it allows like vulnerable browsers to actually execute commands onto your device, which is uh, you know pretty nasty as far as vulnerabilities go. Um, it was a lot of work to do that. I had to look up for a lot of, uh, uh, I had to look up a lot of ways to automate different things. So these devices, I keep them all in airplane mode pretty much all the time. So in order to do this testing, I needed to turn on Wi-Fi for all of them, so I had to figure out how do I do that. A lot of them, I've never provisioned for Wi-Fi, so I was like, well, how do I provision Wi-Fi? You know, my, how do I tell it what my network is without having to go to each one and type it all in? And so there was a lot of things that came out of automating that. Uh, I'll have to find the script that I did and put it up somewhere without the passwords in there. Uh, but I haven't done that yet. I've used uh, used a, a, a subset, so you can see from the device output list, I had four Nexus 7 tablets, and I used those for some browser fuzzing uh, for part of the book. And that was really interesting to do, um, You know, seeing the browser pop up a lot. It was a lot of fun. So there's a lot of things you can do with it, and, and they're very helpful. So lessons learned. Uh, over, over, over the couple of years that I've had this, there's various problems that have appeared. Uh, you know, you end up with things that fall off, and the software control of the hubs helps with that. Sometimes it doesn't help with that. I have one device in particular that if it falls off and I put it back on, I actually have to go and like change the configuration manually. Otherwise, it won't run ADB. Um, so there's little weird nuances like that with some of the devices. And then also you get like random sounds emanating. Uh, there's, some Android, there's some Samsung devices that they'll like, you know, do some fancy beep when they finish charging. And so sometimes they'll just discharge a little bit and then they'll charge again. So you get that going on. If it's distracting you, you can always put this in another room from where you work, I guess. Uh, and I mentioned the battery issue. So yeah, so I've replaced probably a handful of batteries at this point. So in the future, I'd like to, like I mentioned, get more devices. If you have some old Android devices that you don't want, uh, please donate, and you'll get your name added to the front and in the README, or if you'd like. If not, we can keep you anonymous. Uh, you know, I want to automate further, so there's a couple of tools, PrivMap and Can Has Access that I wrote. Uh, PrivMap will allow you to look at running processes and what permissions, users, groups, and so on that these have. Um, which is really important for a system that's that's uh, that's so privilege separated like Android. Like everything is kind of running with a different user, and everything has different groups access. Uh, so that's a really important tool. I want to put that together with uh, with Can Has Access and, and some of the other co device comparison stuff. Uh, so Can Has Access does a similar thing, but with the file system. So it's kind of like Find slash you know dash perm four thousand or whatever, but it actually looks at more than just uh, what you tell on one find command line, and will prioritize the output for you. So you, if, if there are set UID binaries, they'll be at the top, and if there are, are things that you can read, they'll be at the bottom. Uh, and I'm also open to suggestions. You know, this is all on GitHub. All the tools are on GitHub. If anybody wants to contribute anything, and please do, just, just send a pull request or, or hit me on IRC or Twitter or whatever, and we can coordinate. Um, in conclusion, device differences complicate security research in Android. Uh, the fragmentation issue, and, and you know, they say it's sort of a bad word when you say fragmentation. Although I'm okay with saying bad words, um, it, it really does cause problems on all sides. It, it, help, it, it causes problems on defense. It causes problems on offense. It causes problems everywhere. So this is one way that we can help on both sides to make it um, easier to do research and to, to do more effective research with Android. It's definitely worth the investment. So I think, all in all. All the hardware and all the, all the wires, everything that I have there, it's it, the total cost was under ten thousand um, dollars. Most of the devices I got from other people were either free or on eBay. I paid the most was like one hundred twenty dollars, and the average was more like sixty dollars. 
So the recommended, uh, if you're gonna do this, definitely follow the recommendations that are in these slides. Um, ask around for devices, follow the buying guidelines. It'll make it most cost effective for you. Contribute to the tools and you know, you're welcome to join uh, DroidSec IRC or whatever and ask questions there as well. So at this point, I'm gonna, we're gonna do a Q&A. I have this book here. This is a first, first press copy. Uh, so Jason mentioned he has some other copies. Those are uh, second press copies. So this is a, one, of the first, one of the few remaining that I have first press copies. So uh, the, the way we'll do this is whoever asks like the best question will get the book. So think of a good question real, real quick right now and, and I'll answer it. And when I, when I say question, it, it, it's nice if it's related to the talk, it's nice if it's related to Android, but it doesn't have to be, it could be anything really. So let's do this. Yeah. 